Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Um, before I forget, I'm going to say a big thank you to the two lovely ladies at the front, uh, Jane, Gail and Lindsay from the Association of Women Travel Executives for inviting me to be with you this afternoon. Um, this was going to be a very small, intimate evening talk that I was going to be doing for some of their members. Uh, and then they were very excited to say that we could come and do the big stage instead. So thank you. Thank you very much, ladies, uh, for that. I know it's been a long time coming. Uh, and I know this event itself has as well. I also want to invite all of you, if you haven't done so already, to either speak to Jane or Gail. If you ladies want to wave, two lovely ladies, both in green at the front, um, for anybody that has registered for this talk, you will get a free copy of my book, which I'm going to be uh, kind of talking to you a little bit about in terms of my story this afternoon and burnout. So you can get a copy of Mind the Gap, a story of From Burnout to Breakthrough and Beyond. If you have registered, you will already be receiving your copy of that. If you haven't and you would like a copy, uh, please see Gail or Jane. They can ensure that either through business cards or email addresses that they get you registered and you can receive that. So, as I said, thank you very much. I am going to be with you for about an hour this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you for about 40, 45 minutes and then if there are any questions based on anything that I say, please feel free to put your hands up. Uh, I will answer anything for you. And if there is a question that you don't feel that you want to ask in the room, I will be kind of loitering around outside for about 15 minutes after the end of today's session. So if, th if there is anything that you would rather ask privately, uh, then please catch me afterwards. I will ensure that I'm waiting, uh, waiting around for you. But I want to talk to you um, about burnout. And I want to start, I suppose, by talking to you about what burnout is and what burnout isn't, and also maybe apologize for the fact that I don't have a full voice on me today. Uh, we've just been talking. I unfortunately woke up with a little bit of a sniffle a week last Sunday. It's gone straight to my chest, and uh, I, am, I am struggling. But I'm going to ensure that I get through this session with you all this afternoon. But I suppose using that, I want to really kind of, I suppose, show in terms of a scale what we mean by burnout. Because I think over the last few years, particularly since 2020, or even before, let's go pre-COVID, what we used to talk about was the fact that we were all stressed, right? That's how we used to greet each other. Hi, how are you? Oh my God, like I'm so stressed. Oh, me too. Me too. Well, I'm more stressed than you, right? This used to be how we greet each other. How are you? Oh, I'm so stressed. How are you? Oh, I'm so stressed. And then we kind of changed from stressed to busy. How are you? Oh, my God, I'm so busy. How are you? Oh, I'm busier than you are. Oh, no, I'm the busiest. I'm the busiest. And we kind of got into this uh, debate, didn't we? Like, who's the most stressed? Who's the most busy? I am. No, I am. No, it's me, right? I'm, that's me. And then really what kind of started to happen as a result of 2020 is we swapped all of those things for burnout because a lot of the media started to talk to us about the fact that burnout figures were on the rise. A lot of sectors started to talk about the fact that burnout was on the rise. And we've kind of now gone from, how are you? Oh, I'm so burnt out. Oh, me too. And so everybody is now burnt out. But actually, we're not. Not all of us are. And there are some sectors, and there are some people, there are some individuals, there are some companies that are absolutely experiencing burnout. And as I share with you my story this afternoon, and you understand just how serious burnout can be, actually a lot of us are a little bit further down this end of the scale. So if we kind of look at here, this, let's say, is the kind of like normal, right? I don't know if any of us can remember what normal looks or feels like, but this is life is good, life is okay, everything's okay, right? I'm getting all the sleep I need, everything feels great. If anybody can remember what this feels like, come and speak to me afterwards, I want to know how you've done it. But this was kind of normal. 
We then kind of got to the point, or we get to the point of feeling a little bit tired and a little bit run down. And this is probably where I am at the minute with everything that's been going on in terms of my voice and, and everything that I've been dealing with. So I'm probably here. And actually, for those of you that are working in the travel industry, this is the point, actually, where if you stick an, an advert in my face that says, Kelly, you need a holiday, I am booking, right? I don't care where you're taking me, I don't care how much it's going to cost, but if you catch me at this point, I'm coming, right? Passport's at the ready, I'm booking my ticket, and off we go. So this is kind of tired, in need of a holiday, in need of a little bit of break. Then we kind of get to the point of stress levels are, are rising, and we're starting to feel a little bit stressed. And the stress might be impacting our day-to-day -day lives, our day-to-day -day doing stuff, right? Our sleep might be a little bit impacted, our appetite might be a little bit impacted, we might be working a little bit harder. So this is kind of the point at which our stress levels are rising. But I also want to remind you at this point that we need a certain amount of stress in our lives. We need a certain amount of stress to get us out of bed in the morning. We need stress to help us achieve our goals. If we look at worldwide elite athletes, what they're doing to get them over that finish line, to get them winning those cups, winning those races, winning all of those records, is putting their bodies through a certain amount of stress for a fixed period of time. So we do need stress in our lives, but we can't continue to be in that zone of always stressed all of the time. So here, when we need stress, ideally, we want to be starting to make some little bit of changes as we go through. OK, so we've got normal. We've got a little bit tired. We've got stressed. Then we kind of move into things are starting to get a little bit on top of me. I'm starting to drop a few balls. I'm starting to drop a few plates. I know that something needs to change. And actually, I know what it is that I need to change. I'm going to ask my partner to give me a little bit more help. I'm going to speak to my boss about ensuring that I've got some additional help within the team. So this is the kind of, I'm starting to feel overwhelmed, and I'm in control of it, and I can do something with it. And then we start to move towards chronic stress. And chronic stress is burnout. Chronic stress is, I cannot cope. Chronic stress is, I'm going to keep on going and keep on fighting and keep on proving to everybody that I'm OK, because actually, imposter syndrome has wholly taken hold of me. This feeling of, if I stop even just for one minute, everything is going to come crashing around me. The feeling of, just as though you've been taken over. I kind of explain it also a bit like robot mode. If you flick the switch, I'm just going to fall on the heap. So I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going. And actually, what our brain is doing when we get to this point, our brain is in what we call this kind of severe fight or flight mode. Our brain is producing so many chemicals and neurochemicals, and our body's keeping up with that, as though we need that adrenaline to get us over that finish line, to get us finishing that marathon, to get us, you know, as though we're running for our life from polar bears and tigers. Our body is saying to us, you've got to keep going, you've got to keep going, because if you stop at this point, the polar bear's going to get you, the tiger's going to get you, everything is going to fall to pieces. Like, this is not safe. This is what your body and your brain is saying to you at this end of the scale. And so you keep on going, and you keep on going, and you keep on going until the day that you can't. And if you look at the definition of burnout as from the World Health Organization, they talk to us about these feelings of chronic stress. And chronic stress is pretty much as chronic as stress can get. If you Google the impact of chronic stress, or you Google the impact of chronic workplace stress, you will get over 380 million responses that tell you this is what chronic stress looks like. And the majority of that chronic stress will be talking about things like developing heart conditions, 
strokes, serious digestive issues, death, autoimmune illnesses being developed, health conditions that can literally kill you. And so when I see GIFs all over Twitter that are like, show me in terms of GIFs what your burnout looks like today. And I see people posting GIFs of like, you know, running through burning buildings with clown masks on and all of that sort of stuff. I get really, really annoyed with it because at this end of the scale, when burnout can kill you, I get really, really irritated when I see people making light of it. And I think a lot of that has to come from the education piece because I've said at this end of the scale, when we've gone from, hi, how are you? Oh, my God, I'm so stressed. Hi, how are you? Oh, my God, I'm so busy. Hi, how are you? Oh, my God, I am so burnt out. When we're using it as a word to try and explain how we are feeling, because actually we don't know what other word to use, and the media is telling us this is what burnout looks like, that's where I feel we have to get more of this education piece. Because I don't want anybody, any single person ever, getting to that end of the scale. If we can stop it here, with you all taking holidays and selling holidays and doing all of the lovely stuff and taking all of the time out, that's, this is the point that I want to I stop it at. If we can stop it at the point of, I'm feeling a little bit stressed, I'm starting to drop a few plates, or if we can stop it at the, I'm really overwhelmed and I need somebody to help me, this is the final point that I want anybody to ever, ever get to. Because that end is scary. That end can literally be life-ending. And that end is where I got to. And so I want to talk to you about my story. Now, I am and always have been a seriously high achiever. But I suppose I'm one of these annoying high achievers whereby a lot of the stuff that I do, I don't really have to try at. And I have really never had to try a lot to get the achievements that I've got. I was, as soon as I started school, I was in all of the top sets at school. I was moved up a year from primary school because my intelligence levels uh, meant that I shouldn't have to stay an extra year at primary school. So I was moved up a year extra at secondary school. So being the youngest person in the year at secondary school, and I was still in all of these top sets and all of these top groups. And I was one of the best netball players, and I was one of the fastest for a period of time. I was the fastest 400-meter runner in the county. And I would be getting picked for captain, and I would pick for this and pick for that, and it was Kelly's really popular, and Kelly's really great, and Kelly's really smart. And then I started my career, and that continued. And I was the first person to complete a two-year development program that I completed in just under 18 months. I was the first person to get paid what I was being paid for the training scheme that I was on. I unexpectedly fell pregnant with twins and had twins three months after my 20th birthday and still went on to be the UK's youngest HR director, age 30. Over a seven-year period, I had eight promotions and I added an extra £100,000 to my salary. I had team members and peers saying to me, you've got to slow down, you're making the rest of us look bad. But for me, I didn't really think that I was doing anything over and above. It was just what I do. And a lot of the stuff that I was doing just came really naturally to me. And I'd get headhunted for positions, and I would get asked to mentor people in different organizations, and I would get asked to coach people in different organizations. And my organizations were investing a lot of time and a lot of money into me and into my development. And if ever there was a course or a program that I wanted to do, I did it. I hadn't gone to university. I'd, initially, I'd wanted to study law. 
And I did two lots of work experience at two different legal firms. Both times I was able to go to court with solicitors testing these criminal cases and actually seeing a lot of people that I had gone to school with being found not guilty in court when I knew they were guilty. So law kind of went out the window and all of my teachers had been saying to me after uh, kind of nearing the end of, of my levels, but you have to go to university. I didn't see the point of going to university because actually I didn't know what it was that I wanted to do. Um, you wouldn't tell by these trainers that I have got on today, uh, but actually shoes and handbags were always a really big thing for me and getting myself in debt, living on baked beans and not being able to buy my shoes or handbags uh, to then not come out of university knowing what I was that it wanted to do was not something that I opted for. So I did opt for this management development program. But around kind of 24, 25, there was this something in me that thought, I really wish I had got a degree, actually. And now I have three. And again, it's nev I've never thought, this feels really, really hard. I've never thought I really have to try and push for this one. I started it, some of the feedback I didn't always like, but actually I just went on to do it. And that's just how it's always been for me. And lots of people look at me really annoyed, like, I don't know how you do this, like, we hate you. And then some people are like, we want to be just like you, how do you do it? And I'm like, I don't know, really, really don't know. I'd also always been really intuitive. And if my gut feel said to me, do this or don't do this, then I knew to follow my gut. And whilst I could give you an answer from the point of logic and from a point of reason, actually the biggest driver for me was around this gut feel. And I was headhunted for a position in 2011. And I took it, it was a lot more money, it was a bigger team, it was a bigger organisation. I thought, yeah, I can, I can do that. And on the first day of walking into that organisation, my gut said to me, you need to get out of here. And I ignored it. And I ignored it because at the time, I thought it was first day nerves, right? Anybody ever walked into somewhere first day and thought, shouldn't, shouldn't be here, shouldn't be here? Yeah, a few of you. But you stay, and actually things turn out okay in the end, yes? No, not on this occasion. So, <clears throat> first day, gut saying to me, Kelly, get the hell out of there. Second day I go back, gut saying, get the hell out of there. And this continued for two and a half years. But at some point over that two and a half year period, I'd stopped ignoring, or I'd stopped listening to, and started ignoring this intuition and this gut feel. And in doing that, I started to move from here to this end of the stage without even really realizing what was happening. And I kept pushing and I kept fighting. And actually, in terms of being the HR director that I was, and again, as I said, I had these accolades. I was the UK's youngest HR director. I was managing a, a team in an organization of just over 4,000 people. I had a team of 43, I had this huge six-figure salary. I had the bonuses, I had the red sole shoes, I had the handbags. On paper, my life looked amazing. Outside of work, my life looked amazing. Had the house, had the sports car, had the big, people carry a seven by seven, what is it, seven seater thing, had the all-inclusive holidays every year, had everything that looked on paper to be an absolutely awesome life. And yet I hadn't realized on the inside that I was crumbling. And whilst I was still listening to my gut feel, and my gut feel was telling me, you need to get the hell out of here, I refused to ignore it because of this toxic workplace that I was in. 
And with the career that I was in, I had started a career in HR because I wanted to stop the Monday to Friday dying syndrome that so many of us go through, where we are literally working the week away, wishing the week away, living weekend to weekend. That's what I wanted to stop for every single person. Because I genuinely believe that I could change the world of work. I genu genuinely believe that in having my HR career, I could change the world of work. I could ensure that every single one of you sat here, loved your work, was paid brilliantly, was developed, that your manager valued and supported you, and you had everything that you needed to thrive and flourish and be incredible in your career. That's what I joined HR for. Because I genuinely believed that I could change the world of work. And I stayed because the organization that I was in was not allowing a lot of people to have that. And I stayed because a lot of my team would say to me how awesome I was and how much of a difference I was making. And I stayed because some of the leaders and other, other managers that I was supporting would say to me, you are the first person that's ever really heard us. You're the first person that's ever really supported us. You're the first person that really gets what it is that I'm trying to achieve. And I stayed for those people all the while this toxic environment and this toxic leadership team was quite literally sucking the life out of me. And I was managing multi-million pound projects and I was supporting on so much stuff within, within this organization. And we, at the time my organization brought in one of the top four management consultancies in the world. And they were so unethical in a lot of the stuff that they were doing, it almost became my mission to show this big four consultancy that make literally hundreds of millions of pounds a year, and there's little me, the HR director, but I wanted to show them that they could be an ethical consultancy, that there had to be a different way of doing it. And as some of the things that they were doing, I just completely disagreed with, and a lot of the stuff that they were encouraging other managers to do, I completely disagreed with. But I kept on going, because I was a good HR director. I was a brilliant HR director. A lot of the stuff that I was doing just came easily to me, and I wanted to show this consultancy that there was a different way of doing things. So I kept pushing, and I kept fighting, and I kept striving. And then at the end of 2012, whilst the whole organization is complete, in, in complete disarray, I'm pulled to one side by the senior consultant, the senior management consultant, and he says to me, you are going to start consulting with your team. You're going to make all of them redundant. They're going to all apply for their jobs. Um, at the same time as going into consultation, you're going to lead it and you're going to make it happen. And I disagreed with all of it because there was not one reason that any of my team needed to go through consultation. There was not one reason that my team needed to change. And lots of people have kind of said to me since, do you not just think you were being a little bit stubborn? And the answer to that is quite frankly, no. When we talk about it being immoral, what they were asking me to do was immoral and unnecessary and unethical. And I spoke to the chief exec and I spoke to the board and I spoke to the consultancy and I said, we're not doing this. And they said, yes, you are and you're going to make it happen. And so being this amazing HR director that I was, I knew that if we needed to do it, it would be run in an ethical way. I would ensure that every single one of my team was supported through it and I would do every, everything that I could to get them through it and to ensure that we got the right outcome for them and for the organization. And so at the beginning of December, I took my team into consultation. And during the break over the Christmas period, I didn't really switch off. And I went back into work the first week of January on a Wednesday to start interviewing every single member of my team including all of these external people that had also applied for their jobs. And by lunchtime on the Wednesday, I went to stand up from my chair and I couldn't stand. I was kind of bent over. I couldn't straighten because the stomach pain was too much for me to stand up straight. And I was like, oh, I can't move, can't move. 
And the two other directors that I was interviewing with said, Kelly, you really need to go home. And I point blank refused because I was an amazing HR director, I was an amazing leader, and I was not going to let my team down. And so I carried on. And on the first day, I came back into work, and I couldn't stand. And the pain's got even worse, and I'm struggling to even walk. And I walked into the room with the same two co-directors, and they say to me, Kelly, you need to go home. I said, no, I'm not doing it. Because I was a brilliant HR director, I was a brilliant manager, and I was not going to let my team down. And then came the Friday, and I can't stand up, and I'm really struggling to walk, but I still managed to get into London, and I still managed to get to the office, but I couldn't come on the, tre on the tube this morning, because the pain was so severe that I couldn't even stand to pick up my handbag. So I kind of had my bag on a trolley, and I got in a, got in a taxi, and the taxi dropped me off at my office, and I went in the lift. I was always going up and down the stairs, but I went in the lift. And I walked into this interview room, and they said, Kelly, you really, really have to go home. I said, no. I'm a brilliant HR director, I'm a brilliant leader, and I am absolutely going to ensure that my team have every single level of support that they need. And I stayed. And on the train home that night, the pain had got to the point where I just wanted to cry. My one success that day, any of you been on the trains with the sliding doors that you don't know if you've locked them or not when you press the button, right? You've got these flashing lights, am I locked? Right? My one achievement that day was ensuring that I pressed the right button and locked myself in that toilet. And there I sat and there I cried. And I did not realize that I had passed out from the pain until I hit my head on the sink and found myself on the floor. My second achievement was then pressing the button, opening that door and getting myself back to the seat where I stayed until my train came into the station in Peterborough where I live and I got myself off that train, ready to get in the car and drive myself home, have a Chinese and get an early night. But I almost passed out again when I got onto the platform, and thankfully a friend of mine had been on the same train as me. She came running up behind me, her husband was waiting for her outside, and they drove me straight to A&E. A&E couldn't see anything that was wrong with me. Might be a bit of a water infection, might be a bit of a gynae issue, not quite sure, but actually here's some water tablets, maybe a bit of a water infection, get yourself home, get yourself sorted out. But this pain didn't go. And that first A&E trip ended up being the first of seven months of me being rushed into and out of hospital. But even with all of these hospital being rushed into hospital, all of these hospital visits, there was not one part of my logical brain that thought or said or acted in a way that said, Kelly, you need to take some time off work. Not one part. And so on the days that I couldn't physically get myself out of bed, I was still working from my bed. Anybody here a fan of Friends? Yeah, a few of you are a fan of Friends. There's that one episode where they're like, what would it have all been like if we'd have done things differently? And there's Phoebe with her bob and her black suit on, being very important, on her mobile phone, typing away frantically on her laptop. She has a heart attack, right? Gets rushed into hospital. She's smoking from the toilet in her room, and she's typing away frantically on her laptop. That was me for seven months. Because at this end of the scale, when our brains and our bodies are so full of all of these chemicals that tell us that we have to keep on going and have to keep on going, because the bears and the lions and the tigers are about to eat us if we stop, so we have to keep going, that's what was happening. And all of my friends and all of my family are saying to me, like, Kelly, you've got to take a breath. Like, no chance. 
because I'm a brilliant HR director, and I'm a brilliant leader, and I'm going to ensure that my team ensure that they get every single bit of support that they need. But my body was physically shutting down, and I still refused to give in to it. But not one doctor could say to me, this is what the issue is with you. Nobody could give me a diagnosis as to why I was in all this pain. Nobody could explain to me why I all of a sudden started to bloat ridiculously. Nobody could explain to me the eye issues that I was starting to have. Nobody could explain any of this stuff. Until the end of June. And I then started, I was then under two different consultants, two different uh, medical consultants at two different hospitals. And I had two operations in 48 hours at two different hospitals in the July. And as part of that recovery, whilst I was recovering, I still was not stopping working. Because I could still do everything that I need to do. I could still speak on the phone, I could still type away my laptop, I could still think, I could still ensure that I'm the best HR director, the best leader, and ensure that all of my team have got everything they need. I'm still answering queries for everybody in the organization. I'm still managing all these multi-million pound projects. I'm doing it from my bed. I did, however, need a couple of days off after these operations. And I'm laying on the sofa watching mind-numbing TV. Now, this is like 2013, when every single hour was a different chat show that would melt your brain, suck away your soul as you were laying, watching all of these people with all of these issues. So I had days of daytime TV. But my sons had come home from school. My sons were 12 at the time. And they'd come home from school and sat on this coffee table in front of me. And I could see this panic in their eyes. And my response to them was to tell them not to worry because mum was going to be OK and I would be back at work soon. And how many of us have been in a situation where we think, like, I can't move, I can't walk, maybe, you know, I can't breathe, I'm coughing all over the place, can't do any of this sort of stuff. But actually, if I can get myself to work, or I can now, you know, with so many of us working from home, as long as I'm okay to work, actually, I'm fine. That was my response. Mum will be okay, because I'll be back at work soon. Like, that was the barometer of health versus illness. And even after these seven months, I'm still thinking, I can still work, I'm OK. Of course I'm OK. It didn't matter that I'd had two operations in 48 hours. It didn't matter that I couldn't walk. It didn't matter that my body didn't want to function. It didn't matter that I'm ballooning left, right, and centre. It didn't matter that my body was quite literally packing up around me because I could still do my job. And what did that mean? I was a brilliant HR director, a brilliant leader, and still supporting my team. So I carried on. But as my son sat on this coffee table in front of me and took one look at each other and then took one look at me, and one of my sons then said, but mum, your job is killing you. That was the most gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching pain that I had ever experienced, despite the fact that for seven months I had not been able to sit up straight or stand up straight because of the physical pain that my body had been in. My 12-year-old son's looking at each other and saying, but mum, your job is killing you, was the moment that I realised just how stupid I had been. It was like that was the reset button to tell my brain all of this danger that you've been running from, it is now safe to stop. It was the reset button that told my body that I needed to stop because stopping was the only way that I was ever going to get rid of this pain. And so at that point, in that moment, I realized that something did quite drastically need to change. But at the time, I wasn't really sure what. And I started to think about my values, and I started to think about the reason that I went into HR, which, as I said, was to stop this Monday to Friday dying syndrome, change the world of work, and ensure that every single one of you and everybody else 
have a really, really great experience at work. And as I sat thinking about that, actually, that wasn't the experience that I'd been having in this toxic workplace. And whilst my mission, and the big thing for me was about changing the world of work, and it still is, I still want to change the world of work for every single person, I can't do that single-handedly. And it really caused me to look at what I was doing, because actually a lot of my role within HR had been working with some of these unethical consultancies, making people redundant for really no other reason than a bit of a cost-saving activity, upsetting people, demoralizing people, and quite frankly, creating a pretty crappy place to work. So I knew that something needed to change, but I'm still like, what? what do I do? What do I do? The first thing really should have been, get a new job. Wasn't there yet. That came later, but that really should have been my first thought. So the cogs are churning, and I'm thinking something has to change. Something has to change. And then within kind of like a week later and then a week after that, I'd gone to see these two consultants that had done these two operations in 48 hours. And both of them had said to me, we need to talk to you about stress. I thought, well, I'm not stressed. <laughs> no, I'm not stressed. And then they started to speak to me about burnout. This was a word I'd never heard before. The World Health Organization didn't actually coin it as anything until 2019. This is 2013. I don't know what burnout is. And they started to speak to me about this chronic stress. And we started to look at pretty much every symptom that I had physically been experiencing. And at first, I wanted to like scream at these consultants. Like, I've had seven months of you not knowing what's wrong with me. We've just done these operations. Surely these are the questions that we should have been asking before I went under the knife. But actually, what they wanted to do was fix the issue that was in front of them. And then they wanted me to start to fix the issue to ensure that I could recover from what it was that was happening. So we started to talk about my headaches. We started to talk about my loss of appetite. We started to talk about my sleep patterns. We started to talk about this physical pain within my belly, these digestive issues. We started to talk about intolerances and allergies that I had been experiencing. We started to talk about some of the mental health issues that I had been experiencing. We started to talk about the mental health, now life-changing bipolar diagnosis that I have been given. We started to talk about the autoimmune issues that my body had been creating and the gynecological issues that my body had been creating. And we talked about the fact that age 32, one of the operations that I'd had had put me into early menopause. So I'm 32 years old, the youngest HR director, brilliant HR director, brilliant leader, was not going to let my team down, who has now got lifelong health conditions as a result of not paying attention at any of these stages and ignoring my intuition and just thinking I can keep going. Because by the time I got to that end, I didn't have a choice. Because the neurochemical reaction that was going on in my brain and the physiological chemical reactions that were going on in my body were actually getting me to keep running from the bears and the polar bears and the tigers and keep me alive. Whilst the flip side of that was that every single one of those chemicals and every single one of those reactions was actually very slowly killing me. And then, once they started to talk about burnout, that was when I knew that something needed to change. And I started to look into, okay, so it's chronic stress. So what did I do, everybody? Did I take a break? No. I did loads of training. Loads and loads of training. <clears throat> And to add to my psychology degree, I did some certificates in neuroscience, and I trained in psychotherapy, and I trained in hypnotherapy, and I wanted to understand what had caused all of this stuff to go on in my brain from a stress perspective. 
because no longer, although I still want to change the world of work for everybody, what I was going to do now was ensure that not one person in the world would ever be stressed again. <laughs> not one person. So I was going to stop all workplace stress and ensure that every single person would never ever have to experience this thing called burnout. I was going to stop every single person experiencing chronic workplace stress. So I still didn't take any time off. I'd gone back to work in the September and thought something needs to change. And then thought, I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to change the word of work and stop everybody having stress. And that's what I did. So within three months, January 2014, I'd quit my six figure salary. I'd gone home and spoken to my husband about it. I had this idea in, July, in, the, in the October, about a month after I'd gone back to work, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to start my own business and it's all going to be brilliant and I'm going to change the world of work and I'm going to stop everybody getting stressed and it's all going to be awesome. And I was the main breadwinner and he said, that's great, but we need to get some money behind us because we had literally just spent every single penny that we had on a brand new house and renovating this whole house, right? So we've got no financial cushion whatsoever. And I heard him and I quit my job. So I have started my consultancy that is going to change the world of work and stop anybody else ever having to experience stress again with no financial cushion, no idea of how to run my own business, no team behind me, but it felt good. And so I kept going. And I kept going, and I was making loads of money in my first year of business. And I've got this business malarkey sorted, right? I'm earning all this money, and everything's great. And then 2015 hit, and I've done all of this research, right? I understand how the brain works. I was asked to write a book on overcoming stress, how to overcome stress. I've written this book. I'm a published author on how to overcome stress. And 2015 comes, and I start to experience these stomach pains. But it couldn't have been burnout because I'd already had the operation for that, so I carried on going. And then I started to experience these headaches and my sleep went out the window again, but it could not be burnout. And this time it wasn't because I was the best HR director in the world and the best leader in the world and supporting my team. This time it was because I had done all of this training and I knew how my brain worked and I knew what caused stress and I knew I was not stressed. So, I'd also moved house, left my husband, started a new relationship, had two other stepsons kind of come into the fold, but I wasn't stressed. Had the perfect life again, beautiful house, beautiful car, growing business. My bank balance is increasing day by day. And in 2015, I was working in London with a client in the June, and I'd got into the toilet, and the room had started spinning, and I'd hit my head against the wall, and thought, well, that was a bit of a dizzy turn, wasn't it? But this time I did go to speak to the doctor quite quickly, and this time the doctor put me on some medication quite quickly to try and even out all of this stuff that had been going on in my brain. But the medication wasn't what I needed. And the medication was, again, changing all of these neurochemicals within my brain. But rather than me feeling better on this medication, rather than starting to feel better, I started to dip. And I spoke to the doctor about it, and they said, but we just need some, you know, needs a few days, a few weeks for these things to happen. So I trusted the doctor but I knew in my head and in my gut, I was not on the right tablets. I should not be on this medication. But the neurochemicals again that are going on in my head are telling me, doctor's given you this, it's okay, you've got all of this stuff going on again. Perhaps you were a little bit stressed, so let's kind of toe the line this time. Let's listen to the medical professionals, let's start it. But my head and my gut were telling me, get off these tablets. And Christmas Eve of 2015, Thankfully, because of all of the training that I had had up to that point, I rang my partner and I said, I need you to come home. 
because all I can think about is whether I jump in the river or go and jump off the train track and I need you home now. Because I knew with all of my training that I needed to get myself out of the primitive part of the brain that was causing all of these thoughts of, I don't want to be here anymore. And I needed to get into the logical part of my brain that was going to help me find the solution to say what it is that needs to change. And he came home and we talked it through. And by the time we got to the point of, we're well, not going to take your life until the 13th of January, that felt enough of a gap. And the answer was, I'm not taking any more of those pills. And to this day, I have still not taken any of those pills. But in order to get me from burnout to that point of breakthrough, to now be in the way beyond that I am, something seriously had to change. And the biggest thing that I realized was the day that I had switched off that intuition, the day that I had stepped away from this inner knowing, what I now call who we are at the core, which we will all have, this inner knowing that says to us, this is who we are, and this is what we do, and this is how we live, and this is how we can be happy and successful and do all of this stuff. When we listen to this part of us, this part of us keeps us safe, and this part of us ensures that we are the best HR director, the best leader, and the best manager that any team could ever have. This part of us says, you are the best person that you can be. This part says, the confident you, the able you, the brilliant you, that part of us is always there. But as we start to increase all of the stress that's in our bucket and we allow all these chemicals to take over and our head then takes control and our head says to us, you have to stay because you cannot change the world of work unless you're doing all of this stuff. It was that core-led part of me that I knew I needed to stick to. And so for pretty much now, the last eight years, that's what I've been focused on. How can every single one of us ensure that we listen to this intuitive, core-led part of us that says, keep going or stop, or do the right thing or don't do the right thing? Because when I listen to this part, this part says, you need to take a day off today, and I go, okay, fine. There's no longer any question. Because I'm no longer trying to be superwoman. I didn't realize that's what I was trying to do. But as the chemical and everything was changing in me, that's what this end was telling me. You have to keep going because it's scary. But the more that I listen to this part, and the more that I help people listen to this part, the core knowing part of us that is confident and happy and able and driven and can do all of that stuff, that's how we move from burnout. Now, with all of the research that I've been doing over the last almost 10 years now, toxic workplaces are the number one cause of burnout. Toxic workplaces are the number one cause of burnout. Because within toxic workplaces, there isn't trust, there isn't communication, there isn't development, there isn't investment, there isn't do you need to take some time out, there isn't how can I help you or how can I support you. Toxic workplaces create fear. Toxic workplaces create hustle harder. Toxic workplaces are full of silos and backstabbing and bitching and where everybody is out for themselves. So we change, we prevent, and we stop burnout when every single one of us recognizes that in doing the right thing and leading from our core, we create happier, healthier workplaces. And in creating happier, healthier workplaces, that stops us from burning out. And then we start with it with a two-pronged approach, because actually every single one of us is responsible for preventing burnout, for breaking through and going beyond. Because if I focus on me and ensure that I am core-led and leading from my core, if I step foot into a toxic workplace again tomorrow, I'm not staying. I'm not going to push myself to the point of near death for a second time because the core part of me says, you're better than this, get out. 
the core part of me would get me out of there on day one when my gut said, run. So I'm responsible for preventing burnout by listening to that inner part of me that says, don't do this anymore. But on the other side of that, every single one of us as leaders, managers, employees, wherever it is that we may be, we are all responsible for preventing burnout because if we all live and lead from our core, there is no toxic workplace to push people towards the point of burnout either. And if you have got those toxic workplaces, there are en enough of us that then say, because I am core-led and living and leading from my core, I'm not staying. So you can be as toxic as you like, but this just is not for me. So we stop burnout, we break through, and we go beyond when we're all able to say that we live and lead from our core, that the inner part, the knowing part of us, just knows what, is it, what it is that we need to be doing. We change the world of work when we prevent burnout, and we change the world of work when we eliminate toxic workplaces. Thank you very much. <laughs> Need some water. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there, are there any questions? I think there's like nine minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Hey, Gail, I think there is. Well, we do. We have a lady. We have a roving mic. Um, one of the questions um, is around your first husband. Did he support you? You don't mention that. Um, but actually, um, my big question is, do you think that resilience um, with stress helps it or is it, does it hinder? I mean, I'm thinking that if you're... I mean, you're clearly very resilient, but you still fell prey to burnout. Uh, so did my husband support me? No. Um, does resilience for, again, I think from a resilience perspective, and I think resilience is one of those things, isn't it? I, thought, I think we can teach resilience, and I think we can all become resilient, but ultimately none of us know if we are resilient until we get into a situation that tests it. So I think, you know, I could, like, we could all probably put our hands up and go, yeah, I'm really resilient, and then one thing could happen that might tip us over the edge, or a hundred things might happen and we could keep on going. So. I think that's, that's one thing that we, that we need to recognise. I think resilience is really only something that we can test until we find ourselves in a situation where we need to do it. But again, ultimately, I think resilience can only assist us if we recognise it lower down the scale. Because at that point, as I said, the, everything that takes over is literally like you've just got it, like literally you're on the treadmill. Like you are running from the polar bears and you're doing everything. So from that perspective, you could absolutely say, yes, that's where resilience is there because it wants to keep you safe. But ultimately, it's trying to keep you safe from the wrong thing. Like there is no polar bear. What you're doing is you're running straight into danger. Yeah, does that make sense? Thank you. Any other questions? No. Oh, yes, hi. Hi. There's a mic on its way to you. Are you running in heels, ladies? Because if you are, that's very... Oh, no, she's got flats on. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. So, thank you. I resonate with so much of what you said, so thank you. And uh, my question is, how can you really help a toxic workplace getting out? <sighs> that's like probably a whole other talk, but I think... I think in terms of toxic workplaces, and again, I think there's... I think one thing, certainly, that a lot of my team members would say, so a lot of the team that I had whilst I was in that organisation, because I protected a lot of my team from a lot of the toxicity that was going on, a large majority of my team would not say it was a toxic workplace. But a lot of my colleagues and a lot of my peers and a lot of other people within the organisation would say it was a toxic workplace. And so I think toxic workplaces can look like different things for different people. But I think ultimately we need to be speaking up. And, well, we've got two options. We can, or maybe more options, but we can speak up and say, this is toxic and I'm not staying. Or we can just go. Or we can stay and fight and try and change it. But I think that we have to acknowledge 
it's the workplace that's the issue, not me. Because again, when I said with everything that, that I was going through, and again, you know, I coach hundreds of people a year in terms of this, a lot of the situation when you get to the point of burnout, you think it's you. I failed, I was the issue, I was the, I was the big problem. And of course I was to some extent because I continued to allow myself to stay there, but I didn't say loud enough, this is a toxic workplace, this is what it's doing to me and this is what needs to change. And I think that has to be a starting point for a lot of us. Does that help? Thank you. Anything else? Hi. Hello. Um, just a short question. If I, as a co-worker with someone, I would notice that my colleagues are showing signs of going too far, what would your tip be or recommendation for me to act to help? I think, again, there are lots of different ways. And as I said throughout my talk, lots of people were telling me, this is what's happening to you. And I was like, I'm like, you're, like, you're crazy, right? You're absolutely ridiculous. This is not happening. Why do I need to slow down? So I think there is, there is a part of that. <clears throat> and if you're seeing it in your colleagues, there's probably a big part of them that is kind of, mind your own business, because I'm absolutely fine. But I think you can, so there are so many resources out there. If you do see the ladies that get a copy of my book, you can give them that. Because again, I think with um, a lot of people that have seen it or read it or gift a bill, I didn't realize this was me until I saw it in black and white. So I think with a lot of the resources that are out, like literally give them a book, give them a resource. There's videos all over the place, there's podcasts all over the place. There are so many resources because you saying to them, these are every single one of these things you have. They're gonna be like, no, I don't think so. But allowing them to see it for themselves will I hope cause them to say something needs to change. Does that help? Thank you. Anything else? No. I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you again to the Ladies' Association for Women, Travel Executives, uh, Gail, Lindsay and Jane for inviting me. Thank you very much, all of you, for listening and staying. And again, if you haven't seen Gail or Jane um, and you want to register, get a copy of the book uh, or leave your email address. Do come and have a quick chat with them now. And again, if you do want to, you've got a personal question, I'll be outside for about 10, 15 minutes, um, just loitering if any of you want to come and say hello. But thank you very much. Thank you.